uh, let me introduce the um, Dr. Uh, Myron Heitmanek today. Uh, now he is professor at the um, Seoul National University, and he was um, also served as a professor at Songyuan University and University of Pennsylvania. And he honored as um, James Bamfrit Award for Peace Corps Service in Korea, 2008, and he was a really prolific writer, and his book includes the entitled The Confucian Words of Germany, edited with the, um, the Du Wei Ming. So let me welcome him to the, um, the podium and uh, give him a big hand. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. Um, I am, as introduced, Mylon Hate Money. I sometimes forget what language I'm talking about. Uh, I've come to love Korean a lot. I'm not good at it, but uh, it's a beautiful, uh, endlessly fascinating language. My topic today, the restless quest for moral excellence and bureaucratic competence, We'll have its esoteric moments, I warn you. Um, but I also hope that you'll agree with me. The things I'm talking about are extremely practical, extremely relevant. I'm incredibly honored to be in the presence of so many impressive people. Uh, some I've had the chance to say hello to, some I haven't. Um, and uh, I uh, hope that my talk will illumine parts of Korea, perhaps, that you haven't had a chance to uh, examine. Um, this talk really had its origins, its deep origins, as a historian named Sataka origins, uh, in 1976, when I came to Korea first as a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, knowing nothing about Korea. I knew one word of the Korean word, Shijo, Shijo, Korean. It's the only word I knew. Um, I uh, was ready for an adventure. I had no idea how great an adventure it would be. I think those of you who are new to Korea perhaps will share my excitement and perhaps some of my confusion that I had in that year of 1976, as I was given a brutal course of 12 weeks of Korean language um, and shipped off to the South Korean countryside in Kohongun, Cholunda Kohongun, the south coast, a little rural town where I worked in a health center speaking no English for two years at all. And of course I was hopeless and helpless. Um, but within a year at least, I, I felt I was beginning to understand things around me. And I found a strange contradiction. The contradiction was this. Although Korea looked economically shabby um, and very much rough and in the state of development, paved road in my town only came about then. There were uh, many people that would objectively when we call poor. Um, and yet, there was something to Korea that I couldn't quite fathom, some possibility. I was shocked when I went to the local high school and found the farm kids in a rural high school. Young boys learning to be farmers were studying calculus in high school. I assure you in America, and he took one how calculus is not studied by all but a few college-bound kids in most public schools, and certainly not in my real high school that I studied. That was a hint. The other part of the contradiction is when I went up to Seoul, my, some of my uh, foreign colleagues were very contemptuous of Korea. This was not a pleasant period. The axe murders of Pan Minjong, Park chung hees dictatorship. There were people in the Blue House, Pistol Pak, Park chung and others, that didn't give a, a good impression. And my friends weren't willing to look beyond that. And they couldn't understand my enthusiasm for Korea and my hope for Korea's future. But even I was surprised, after three years in the Peace Corps, I returned in the mid-80s during the democracy movement. I sat through many classes with tear gas, tears streaming down my eyes, reading Kim se yuk Jung and Jung ta san these 18th century texts. Um, it was a strange and beautiful moment for Korean, the birth of democracy here, or the reconfirmation of democracy. But Korea had developed so much. When I first came to Korea, you couldn't make a telephone call 
from, from Kohum to Seoul. You could not do it. You had to go to Gwangju to do it. By that time, they had paid telephones, and there were a few computers around. Primitive, but still computers around. When I came back in the 1990s, cell phones had appeared, and you could call anywhere, anytime. And now, in the 21st century, uh, Korea is probably, uh, along with Finland, uh, the most wired country in the world. It's an extraordinary fact. And all along the way, I, my foreign friends kept saying, Korea is not that impressive. Korea is not that impressive. I was like, Kwasol Pimka, honey. Kwasol Pimka. That's the. And I, I kept asking myself, why is it that many of my, especially, alas, American friends, cannot see the possibilities in Korea, cannot fathom this country can be more than it appears to be. I wasn't sure. But I think as my studies progressed as a graduate student at Harvard University, um, the examination system became part of that. Although every Korean is so familiar with the examination system and with the genealogical system, it's boring. My students at Seoul National don't want to hear about exams. They take it for granted. But in America, we simply don't have anything like this, and in and many European countries either. Um, the state examination system is a truly remarkable part of the Korean past. I hope I can convince you. It is world class in every sense, um, and uh, is a silent partner, I think, a hidden partner in Korea's development. Examination culture is, is also brutal. You follow the events at KAIST, students killing themselves with the brutal demands of competition. <laughs> it's really sad. I'm, I'm happy to say none of my students have killed themselves because of my classes, but uh, it gives me, gives me pause. So that's sort of my background and motivation. This is not, I hope, to be seen as an esoteric talk discussing events of thousands of years ago. I will do that, but I would like to sort of get at this question I'm still trying to get at. What Korea is becoming? What Korea will be in 20 more years? I'm not sure, but I think the educational system and the, the inner rotor of it, the examination system, is a, a very important part of Korea's uh, current excellence and future uh, great excellence. In this talk, I will cavalierly, I'm in the presence of genuine experts, and so I'm abashed to speak in front of them, um, discuss the following topics. I'll look at some of the very early history, um, because I think it's relevant and interesting. And I'll turn to the main topic, which is the Chosen Era, uh, state examinations. The Chosen Times, of course, this enormous block of time, 500 years, uh, over 500 years, 1392 to 1910. Um, I'll uh, turn to uh, some of the darker sides, the darker side of the examination system. Just as now exams produce social problems, so too then. Exams, examinations was fraught with tension, controversy, and um, was um, quite, um, quite the object of much considered attention and criticism. And then I'll turn to the latter part of my talk. I hope it won't be too boring. I'll give you some new data. Uh, this is material that is f more or less hot off the press. It's not published, or it's not even published yet. Looking at um, the question of who succeeded after they passed the examination. You know, just because you passed the examination didn't mean that you would immediately become an ambassador, say. No, um, there was something else. And some of my data actually is very shocking to many Koreans, and interesting, I think. And it challenges our understanding of the Korean past. So that's kind of the roadmap of uh, where we're going today. <clears throat> the early history, um, as you know in Korea, the Hagukodesa, uh, the ancient history, is vital, it's important, it's talked about a lot. Uh, international tensions stem from different interpretations of the deep Korean past. And we do not know, in fact, how far in the past examinations began. They begin about as far back as there's recorded history. Uh, but certainly from the famous magical year of 372, when in the northern state, in the three kingdoms of Koguryo, began the first institution of higher learning, uh, the so-called Teha, the National Confucian University, we think there must have been examinations. Because this institution was um, done in emulation of a similar institution in China, the Han Dynasty uh, Academy. 
And the curriculum, we know, um, consisted of a concentrated study of the essence of human knowledge, the best of the best. And that was concentrated, people then believed, into the so-called five classics. And these were not just, um, as I said, musty books. These were gateways into, into different varieties of human experience. Uh, history was a large part of that. The book of history dealt with uh, human civilization from ancient times uh, down to the present. And it did one important thing, better than anything else. It held forth the possibility of an ideal society. An ideal society. So how long she did? At the dawn of civilization, the record told, there had been social peace and peace, social order, there had been wise kings, and society fell away from that. And this set the agenda for anyone who read in Korea for 2,000 years. The agenda was easy to say, impossible to achieve. How to create a good society right here and now. That was the dream. And uh, I've always felt that there's a, there's a sad and plangent note to Confucianism. One reason I like Confucianism against all <laughs> against all the odds. Confucianism is very unpopular in Korea. I ask my students, who likes Confucianism? No one raises their hand, not one student. <laughs> um, Confucian ideals, as I said, in their essence, I think have a, has a, have a true beauty. And one of the, the sad beauties is that from the time of Confucius himself, Confucius saw himself as standing at the end of time. He saw himself as living in the ruins of a beautiful past. And he's feebly trying to, modestly trying to get some energy together to recreate a beautiful, to recreate the past and build a better future. That was the goal. Living in their ruins and trying to recreate civilization. And every generation since Confucius has tried and failed. Every Confucian knows in their heart they will fail too. After all, if 20 generations have failed, if Confucius failed, if Mencius failed, if all the, the previous generations, who am I to succeed? And yet, and yet there you go, you throw yourself into the maw and you try to create that beautiful society. That was the education of the um, book of uh, uh, history. They also, something called the Spring and Autumn Annals. And this is a book of history supposedly written by Confucius about recent times. It's called the Gunde Sai, you might say, recent wars. But the thing about this book that was intriguing is Confucius always believed there was a hidden message. I'm always supposed There's a hidden message. You read between the lines, and you will discover hidden truth. And so this taught, you might say as a hermeneutics, this taught people to read, not for the surface meeting, but to get deep into the guts of the text and try to find out, ferret out. Confucius is sending me Morse code. Confucius is sending me a code. I've got to find out what he's saying. The code is in the book. So again, a very interesting work. The um, book on poetry, the Shigyan, uh, the Shujing uh, spoke to the lyrical side of Korea. If you've been in Korea even one day, you will know that um, there are some fascinating paradoxes in Korea. Many Koreans are very stern and upright, but in the evening they become um, emotional and they love to sing. Uh, and I urge you, if you stay in Korea long, you've been here long, you should learn to sing. My first day I had to sing a song in Korea. <laughs> And I was embarrassed. Uh, I've had to sing in front of hundreds of people in the rural countryside because singing is um, important. It has been as far back in history as we know. Writing poetry became a core task to be a human. You cannot be a human without writing poetry or singing. You simply can't. And so poetry became part of the Korean worldview. Ritual. Ritual sounds very boring. The yegi, or the ji, sounds very boring. But actually, ritual is something much more fascinating. It's Indiana Jones. It's power. Ritual is a, is a way to exercise power through proper behavior. It's the intersection of behavior and power. And it had immense consequences um, for uh, living, living and dying, how to conduct yourself. And so, the idea of how to behave properly in society became a core part of the Korean soul, and it is to this very day. The Koreans will often say, we're the 
or the sort of the ritual, the ritual loving people of the East. And this sounds uh, almost like a propaganda, but there's a certain truth to it. A lot of people in Seoul in particular go around wanting to behave in the right way towards strangers in particular, through courtesy. Um, and finally, perhaps the most impressive of all, the so-called Jia Jolie, or Yi Jing, Yi Jing. Yi Jing, of course, is a set of these 64 hexagrams. And it's a strange patterning um, that looks like an abstract algebra uh, set that is long and short, uh, paired, unpaired, um, that have encompass it, it's a patterning of all the existence. And so it taught Koreans a kind of deep mathematical understanding and apprehension of how there is a pattern to everything. And you can seek the pattern and understand it, then you can um, navigate in life better. So you can see this is a very, this is a very uh, deep, profound curriculum to have had in 372 uh, with the warrior like Koguryo. But these have been durable, they have stayed with Koreas till the 20th century. My students at Seoul National are not reading these books. But I like to think that the, the residue, the cultural residue, still lingers uh, with them. And perhaps one or two of them, well, with my urging, will read some of them. Because these are durable classics and they won't go away. Now this curriculum was developed in competitive fashion in Koguryo's rivals. As you know, the, the Korean Peninsula was divided into three states that became intense rivals, sometimes uh, cooperating, uh, often fighting each other, the southwest Pekche, the, north, uh, the southeast Shilla, um, and became um, a part of the um, fundamental cultural fabric of Korea. In the so-called unified Shilla period, after Shilla managed to finally destroy its enemies, uh, Pe uh, Pekche and Koguryo, the, uh, this learning became, and the test became a routine part of a national education. But added to this was one more element, uh, which was overseas study, overseas study. And I want to mention this because it's so much a part of Korea now. Uh, there are tens of thousands of students from abroad studying in this country. I'm amazed at how many Chinese students there are now, for example. Uh, I was saying, I have some of my best students from Mongolian students, actually. I've taught a student from Bhutan for the first time. The first person I met from Bhutan a student at Seoul National, and it's marvelous to see so many foreign students here. But similarly, Korean students have been streaming abroad in vast numbers um, uh, for the last, over the last hundred years. That is the normal situation, and that began already in the seventh century. Uh, we have the amazing story of Che Chi Wan, very well known in Korea, of a 12-year-old boy, a 12-year-old boy, a very bright lad, in the ninth century. His father said, you're going to China, 2,000 miles away. You're going to the capital of the world, Chang'an, the most developed, most impressive, most sophisticated city on Earth. You will go there, and you will pass the state examination. If you don't pass, I will disown you. You're no son of mine. Or at least that's what the records uh, uh, says. It's a remarkable fact. In the ninth century, Koreans were sending 12-year-old boys to study 1,500, 2,000 miles away. Just like today, how many Koreans are being sent to New Zealand, to Europe, uh, to Australia, to America um, to study uh, with their parents and often without their parents. Um, and examinations became a focus, a way to understand what your study should be and a way to demonstrate um, to yourself and to your family that you had succeeded. Koreans came to develop their identity through examinations both within Korea and outside Korea. And so this curriculum, which was, it's called Confucian, and that, you sort of get the feeling that that means it's a very um, esoteric, uh, philosophical, and not very practical. No, nothing could be further from the fact. Confucianism became very philosophical later, it became extremely esoteric, and um, these very uh, refined debates about uh, principle and material force, EMD and so forth. That's far in the future. Confucianism at this time meant how to be a human being and to rule statecraft. Because it was developed by the mightiest empires of the day, the Han Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty. Um, and they understood Confucian learning to be the way you exercise power. The way you exercise. So examinations and power became linked. And the way to get power 
listed through the examinations. And Che Chi Wan, for example, tasked the exam in China. His father was proud, I suppose, and he became a very high official in China, well known in Chinese history. When he came back, less successful. He couldn't get a job in, the, in, in, in Korea. This became a problem. So that's sort of the early history. In Cordio, the next dynasty, <coughs> as you know, lasted uh, from 918 to 1392. Uh, this was a very long, complicated, and turbulent period. And the examination matched that length, complexity, and turbulence. In 958, a very strong monarch, Guangzhou, took advantage of a, of a uh, Chinese diplomat, Shuangji, who had decided to stay in Korea. At the time, China was divided into five kingdoms. Uh, the country was in disorder, and Chuangji decided he wanted to stay and live in Korea. And so the monarch used him to create a bold new institution, a state examination system that would be used to select the best of the best, the elites who would then be loyal to the king, rule the country, the king could with his um, his firm hand, his central desire for centralized control, he would have these intellectual shock troops that he could dispatch around the country and use them to deal with the local pockets of existence to him. So the examination system became part of a royal centralized monarchy um, that selected for talented people and when hoped loyal to the, the, to, to the uh, king as well. And that system uh, proceeded and lasted to be very uh, complicated 12th century, in which Korea went through a rebellion. Half of China disappeared at the time. Japan was in the throes of changing from the Han to the common court of Korea. The 12th century was a really messy period. Um, in 1170, Korea was taken, was taken over by a military clique. Uh, for, but the examinations continued. They still continued. They continued until the Mongol period, uh, which lasted 1260 to 1368. And even then, from 1313, the Mongols re revived the um, examination. And as you know, the Koreans had a special relationship with the Mongols. It was a deep and personal relationship. Every Korean crown prince married a Mongol princess. And so um, in the English-speaking world, we revere Kublai Khan because of the famous uh, poem Xanadu. Kublai Khan's son-in-law was a Korean prince. Um, and Koreans at the time could travel freely uh, to China. They could stay many years. And they could take the examination. Famous scholars as E. J. Hun uh, passed the examination and were famous within China, as well as returning to Korea. This created a very healthy dynamic, I think, of, of um, allowing a, a exchange of, of uh, UN dynasty uh, viewpoints, which included all uh, included technology and and new um, mathematics that stretched all the way to the Arab world. When the Mongols captured Baghdad in 1258, they brought back many experts, including astronomers, and mathematicians, and in fact, the high point of mathematics in East Asia uh, before the 20th century was in the 13th and 14th centuries. The Koreans participated in this. They came back, and the Korean institutions, the uh, Korean university, uh, shared this excitement because there was uh, new information coming in, constant travel, and Korea became part, for a time, of a, a globalized world. This is going to be the first globalization of Korea that stretched far, far, all the way to Europe in some ways. But with 1368, that door slammed shut and everything changed. The Mongol Empire fell, and the Han Dynasty Ming Empire began, founded, as you know, by a powerful, talented, illiterate monk, Zhu Yanzhang, who was completely uh, opposed to literary culture, and who feared, in xenophobic fashion, one of the great xenophobes, in fact, of the Chinese past, outsiders. And these included, unfortunately, Koreans. And so around 1372, he slammed the door shut to all foreign study in China. And so from 1372 to about 1880, no Korean studied abroad. No. Koreans had studied abroad from the 650s, say, all the way down 
with some interruptions, but all the way down to 1372. 1372 to 1880, no study at all. There was a huge rupture of deep break. And that would um, have a deep impact. But before the door slammed shut, a number of Korean scholars had mastered, at least learned and began mastering, a new way of understanding called Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucianism is a vast topic, but essentially it takes traditional Confucian statecraft and looks deeply into its core and finds a approach to moral truth. Neo-Confucians are deeply concerned, some would say obsessed, with finding the essence of moral behavior. Every day you have to ask how to be a better person, somewhat morbidly. And there were different flavors of this. Some groups looked without, outside to find truth. Other groups looked within, your yangshin, within yourself and your skills. But the notion that you should try to be a better human being, that through learning you can be a better human being, and that you can't rule effectively unless you are a good person. This now became a commonplace uh, of Korean belief and was fostered deeply by the examination system. Because from 1313 on, the Mongols and the Koreans began using uh, Zhu Xi, the famous philosopher from China, the 12th century philosopher. And his views became the core of Neo-Confucianism and almost and became orthodox later down to the 20th century. So the examination system played a role in creating a new goal of society, not just a restoring the beautiful society of the past, but creating beautiful human beings. The great learning says you can't create a great society until you create um, human beings that know morality. And so this became the goal. <clears throat> So with the Chosen period, um, there was Korea, as I said, the Chosen period and Korea generally is sometimes called the Hermit Kingdom. Now, I know some people like this term, Hermit Kingdom, and they use it. I would urge you to forget this term. This is a very dangerous misconception, in my personal view. Um, the Koreans were hermits uh, in the 19th century for about 30 years. For long stretches of Korean history, most of Korean history, people were outgoing, Love to travel, love to study, um, uh, love to venture, love to explore, and liked dealing with foreigners generally. And that Korea has reemerged quickly with the end of the Chosen period. But during this period, there simply was nowhere to go. The Ming Dynasty built the Great Wall. The Great Wall is a uh, object of great attention and pride. People from all over the world want to see the Great Wall. When I see the Great Wall, I groan. Pukurosan in adaptation. I'm, I'm ashamed for China, because I think a wall is a mark of shame. Uh, if the U.S. ever builds a wall along the Mexican border, I will be ashamed. I will not be proud of that. Uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, walls, these are maybe necessary, but they're shameful. A wall is a shameful thing. The Great Wall is a mark of China's failure, not success. It was designed to keep people like the Koreans out. That's how I see it. It's a, it's a magnificent metaphor for China's failing in the mix. You can see I hold strong opinions. But I think they're fair. Because the only way Koreans could ever go to China after 1372 was on missions for 40 days at a time. No free travel, no tourism, no religious um, exploration, nothing. And technically in China, they were even buying books was illegal. Kunjite is illegal to buy books. They had to bribe in order to even function normally in, in China. And so within this context of this, the Koreans re had to reconfigure. They'd been part of a world empire. Now they had to go it alone. The emperor of China was crazy, and Japan was hopeless from their point of view at the time. And so there they were all by themselves. How do we survive? How do we, in spite of these crazy neighbors, create a better world? And so the examination system became part of this, um, this uh, uh, arsenal, this, this set of toolbox. So it was refined and divided into three categories. I'll talk about the first and most the civil exam, uh, which was designed to produce, uh, as the name indicates, uh, the mainstream civil officials. But to their credit, there was also a military exam, that was designed to produce military officials who were not only uh, adept in military skills, but that had higher level 
um, ability to understand strategy and to understand the larger issues, the larger moral issues at stake. A military man should never just be a warrior, he should also be a thinker who is a moral, uh, moral human being. So the military classics uh, became a part of the curriculum as well as military skills. There were also a series of specialist examinations, so-called chakwa. And these comprised these uh, skills such as um, criminal law, calligraphy, uh, painting, divination, medicine, that were necessary for the kingdom, but not considered um, uh, to be the core of what it took to rule. They were functional and important, but they could not be trusted. People with this set of skills could not in the end be trusted with um, the highest power. It was the civil examination, the Munhua, that was the most prestigious by far. And so prestigious that with, with only a handful of exception, exceptions, those of you who know Korean history, the so-called Salimbu, like Song Jun Gil, they said never passed the examination. These were brilliant people who never took the exam. But only a handful, except over 500 years, every high official, every prime minister, every deputy prime minister, all the way down to to um, cabinet ministers, all the way down to their officials, these were all people who had passed this exquisitely difficult test I'm going to talk about. And so they may not have been the nicest people in the world always, this was a problem, but they were extraordinarily gifted in the skills it took to pass. And I'll talk about some of those skills in a minute. So this is, this is remarkable. It, it, uh, as a, I think it may be unique in the world in terms of the intensity. China, of course, had an examination system. The Jinshu exam is very important. China was a much vaster nation. They had 300 million people in the middle. Korea perhaps had, at this time, 5 million, 6 million, 7 million people. An intense world, living by itself, determined to live to the highest ideals, and determined to force all of its officials to pass this exam at a time when European aristocrats mainly could not even read or write. It's an amazing fact. So in addition to the five classics I've talked about, which of course uh, now assumed everyone memorized those by the time they were, say, 10 years old, they had to now use a new set of, of a new canon called the four books. And these four books, <clears throat> unlike the five classics, these were personal, deeply personal books that approached the life of Confucius and Mencius, and then looked into uh, the, the grand plan, the tehak of how to be a better human being and through hu better, through morality, to bring world peace. The goal was world peace and the plan was the great learning. And finally, there was a mystical text called the, the Doctrine of the Mean, the Junyo, the Doctrine of the Mean, that spoke on how to center yourself and how to understand inner truth. So this is a compelling group of texts, compelling group of texts. There was no mathematics. It's a very interesting question, and maybe some of you will have questions about that later. Um, but the, and in terms of history, literature, and moral philosophy, this perhaps was the uh, in, uh, certainly considered refined over many centuries by millions of people to be ideal group of texts to teach young people how to live well. Um, the examination, though, didn't only test that; it tested policy issues. And these were very, very difficult, as you can imagine. Um, many of you have taken exams, your diplomats, uh, this is my exam, I've taken the diplomatic exam in America. Um, and as you know, it's complicated, because you have to not only know what to write, you have to think what the examiner wants you to write. You have to think the examiner doesn't want you to be a lackey. So you, you have to show independence, but you have to show your understanding of the, the national policy. It's very complicated. This is in stark contrast to China. What happened in China, the so-called eight-legged essay. In China, they developed this from the late 1400s, this very formulaic examination. The Koreans remain um, uh, fairly open, complicated. So I'll talk about you also had to be able to write poetry. You had to be able to write good poetry. And if you wrote a good poem on the exam, you could become nationally famous. <coughs> Um, so, uh, the, uh, certainly we know of, uh, of, of, of some cases where um, uh, an exam candidate wrote a poem on the exam, Haso Kim in the uh, 16th century. He wrote an exam, on the examination right there on the spot. 
he wrote a gu, this kind of very complicated prose poem. It's a demanding prose poem. He wrote this poem, and it was still famous 150 years later. 150 years later, when the Chinese emissary came to town, they, they showed this poem. So you could um, gain great renown. The, uh, so the civil examination required a daunting set of skills. It also required something we've, I, I think Americans, and, and alas, and maybe many other countries have forgotten, memory. Memory. It's daunting, amazing to read the possibilities of memorization in, say, 16th century Italy. Matteo Ricci, the great Jesuit missionary, had mastered these techniques that had come from the Greeks and the Romans, was capable, supposedly, of memorizing a Chinese text from beginning to end with one reading. And he did this, he created a mental palace in his mind. He used space, uh, imaginary spaces, to locate ideas. And so by situating a text in a mental palace, he could walk through the palace and recreate it forwards or backwards. And so this, his secret, actually, in the foundation of Catholicism in all of East Asia, uh, among other things, relied on Matteo Ricci's genius of memorization. Uh, Koreans didn't have this omnipotence, it's a different situation. But the point is, every Korean, uh, adult Korean, male Korean, who learned to read, would memorize vast caches of information and have it ready at hand. I think we've, in the days of the internet, we've lost that completely. <laughs> People use Google as a kind of surrogate in memory. When I was a young person, uh, they used to come to my school and force us to memorize the Bible. And I went to just a, a um, village school, and it was a, and we had to do, we had to memorize chapter after chapter after chapter. Was that good or not? I'm not sure. <laughs> so the examination system uh, was not only intense, it was long, it was demanding. In fact, as I'll talk about, you spent most of your life doing this. Uh, this is uh, part of the problem. Because from the time you were first learning to read till the time you died, you dreamed about passing. 99% never, never passed. Uh, this became an obsession with many people. I'm translating a diary from the 16th century, the young book, and this grandfather is trying to teach his child to read. The kid is five years old. And the grandfather's obsessed. The grandfather has passed the test when he was a young man. He became famous. He's obsessed with teaching his grandchild to read. And he tries, and he, he's not very patient. He tries, he tries, he tries for about a month, and he says, I give up. My kid is stupid. <laughs> my, my grandchild is stupid. And in fact, learning to read itself in the classical Chinese of the day was not, not easy. But that was only the beginning of a, of a decades-long quest to pass the exam. There were two levels. The lower stage, which I refer to later in as Sama, the Sama stage, uh, actually very interesting. It had two tracks. You either could go to the classics track or what I call the Bell Depth. That is, you could um, master these classics in depth, or you could learn how to write poetry in many different forms. And it shows a very interesting split in the Korean mind. An, an inability to decide whether poetry is better or classics. But as my data will show, we now have an answer. What was the better strategy? Was it better to study uh, poetry? Was it better to study classics in terms of your career? Um, and so the, these, these tests began at the village levels of Yangshi. And there you were at the village. Um, and most people fail at the village level. But a few actually would pass. And then they would go to the second stage. The second stage was all the way in Seoul. And so for many, this was a weeks long trip fraught with danger. There were tigers still roaming the Korean countryside. It's, it's uh, strange to think. We don't often think, but the uh, Koreans shared the countryside with a variety of wild animals until the late 19th century. Isabel Bird Bishop, in her famous book, Korean Her Neighbors, talks about tigers eating children on the Han River the day before she visited. Uh, during the uh, reading the royal records in the 15th century, tigers roamed Kyungbo Palace at night. In fact, the walls of Seoul were built not so only much for to, to defend against invaders because they never worked. Not once did they protect Korea from the Japanese or the, the Manchus. No, they were designed to keep the tigers out. And in fact, uh, hun thousands of people were eaten alive by wild animals. So just taking the exam, you're risking your, risking your life. Uh, 
and then disease and so forth, and just getting to Seoul, and there you are in Seoul, and you have to you take this test for normal vision. If you do pass, and only of course a tiny fraction, most people go home as failures. Then you get to enroll in the National Academy of Sung Yung Wan. And this was a glorious, many of you have visited the old Sung Yung Wan. You can see it's, it's essentially, it was burned by the Japanese in the 1590s, but the, what we see now is from the 17th century. This was a, 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 a very exciting period for student socks because then as now, students were social protesters. Our earliest protests we know about are in the 15th century already. They're protesting against King Sung Jung. Student protest is an ancient part of Korean history. And the students there were constantly whining over and taking part in national issues. And supposedly, they were, they were prepping for the examination. But herein lies a problem, I would argue. I'll talk about it a little later, too. Which is, by the 16th and 17th century, study at Sung Yung Wan had become formulaic and stagnant. The reason is simple. There was simply not much information from the outside world. Uh, in the 14th century, Korea was far ahead of Europe in many ways. By the 18th century, it had fallen behind. During that interim, the information that Koreans could have used to develop their own technology and to respond to the marvelous changes um, taking place in sciences and in all realms of human knowledge in Western Europe, perhaps they simply had no contact with it. So that the uh, situation of Soviet Union became, I think, increasingly sleepy stagnant, and students became more interested in politics than in study, actually. Now, if you somehow, finally, um, felt you were ready, then you could take the main course, the upper level, upper stage exam. And this truly was a lifelong quest, because uh, in any given session in the 18th century, perhaps tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people would take this test. If you were brave or foolish, you could just start with this test. You didn't need to pass the lower one. But as we'll see, that was a bad strategy for your career. So out of these hundreds of thousands of people taking it, you, you take three separate exams. Um, uh, the, the, the first, the second, and then the third. And uh, the final one was given in the presence of the king. So by then, this group of hundreds of thousands of people had been winnowed to the precious 33 in Samship Sam, uh, typically. And in front of the king, you would be given a very difficult policy. How do we deal with the Jurchens you know, on our border? How do we deal with the Yojin on our border? Uh, and you would have to, as I said, write the right thing that would flatter the king, but would be creatively critical as well. That's the trick, striking the balance. And then they'd be graded, and the number one passer, the number one passer, would be known as a Jangun Kuk Jay, would become famous nationally. Uh, the number one passer in Korea still is famous. Every year, the number one passer is put in the newspaper and, and given up. But this was really important, because if you pass number one in the nation, you were given a huge advantage. You could skip about six years, seven years of drudgery. You were promoted directly to the sixth rank, so the ninth rank. So there was, a, and you became, of course, Famous, and uh, you could marry anyone in the kingdom, or your children could marry it. It was amazing. But just passing itself uh, was important. But as we'll see later, even this precious few that passed, many of them, their lives became wasted and blighted by the system. <clears throat> now, uh, the typical exam was the so called triennial exam, it was given every three years, and it was predictable. Uh, with even during the invasions, even during the Imjin invasions of the 1590s, when the Japanese forced the Korean king to flee all the way to the border with China, they still gave the examinations. Uh, with them. There were also things like Chunglangshi, these felicitous events. Uh, maybe a crown prince is born. Maybe um, there's been some good news from China. Um, there also this called al Shi, when the king went to the Con Confucian Academy, he would give a test on the spot. And if you were smart and lucky, like Zhou Bang Zhou was, 15, when we were 15, then you could become famous, passing in front of the king. Because this, put a, this gave you a special bond with the monarch. But there were also things like special exams. And these were very, uh, very interesting to historians uh, and very irritating to people who live in the countryside. Because the king would say suddenly, hmm, I feel good, let's have an exam. 
and the exam would be in three days. And if you lived in distant Busan, then there's no way you could ever get to Seoul. And so this favored the people who lived in the, the surrounding areas. So there are these hundreds of examinations. Uh, about 29 people a year passed. We know 14,607. We know every passer, as I'll talk about. Um, it's an amazing fact. Uh, from one perspective, and it's a perspective I'm not prepared to defend, but I will throw out, this is the longest running IQ test in world history. Absolutely. We know so much about every candidate, and we know their, their common, we know their family lines. Also, uh, it's possible we don't yet know the mother's line. It's possible with this information, if it were well developed, we could finally test whether the mother's uh, intelligence, or at least the mother's relative's um, passing, is more important than the father's. We could look at the component of the father's side and the mother's side, and maybe make some educated guesses. This is a very powerful group and interesting. Out of the millions, countless millions who took the test, 14,607 passed um, during the period of these um, all kinds of uh, studies. <coughs> Here is, I think, uh, has, I think this is Kim Hong Do showing a painting of the examination system. If you go to Kungbok Palace, you've probably seen the beautiful pavilion set in the the, the, the pond, Kyungmeru. This is one site for the examination, palace examination. In the uh, in the uh, Changduk or Rear Gardens, there's another pavilion where people took examinations. The uh, lucky 33 who sat in front of the king. Of course, never for, for, forgot that great day in which um, they were able to uh, demonstrate their ability in front of Mark. <clears throat> Here's an example of an answer sheet, maybe not the best one, but it's, as you, those of you who can read in Chinese, it's an essay on how to measure land, how to evaluate land. So the topics could be uh, quite um, uh, relevant to uh, your job as a future magistrate. Many of these passers would immediately be sent to the countryside to deal with thorny economic issues. Demonstrating your ability to understand agricultural land management was a important. Here's an example of so-called Pangmok. This is a list of passers separated by category. When, after the exam was held to be posted, and then you could see if your name was listed or not. Uh, we have a treasure <coughs> trove of information. The Academy of Korean Studies is a great center for this and it has a deep tradition. Professor Yi Sung Mu, who used to be there, of course, is one of the great experts on this topic, and I learned much from him personally, and even more from his books. And those of you who read Korean, of course, Yi Sung Mu's books are the best. Now, um, I think I've given a fairly positive um, uh, uh, understanding of the examinations, and I am uh, deeply appreciative of them. If I had to pick one thing that set the chosen dynasty apart, one thing that kept the nation coherent for 500 years, one institution that preserved the dynasty, it's the examination system. It forged, uh, did many things, it forged an identity among a very, um, very different group of elite. It created a central set of ideas and goals, a common ideology, and it produced uh, a useful way for people to waste their youth. Instead of rebellion, they studied, they studied, they studied. <laughs> Nevertheless, the examination system was um, deeply disliked by many people. It was constantly criticized, not only in Korea, but all over East Asia, and still is. As you know, there's a dialogue constantly in Korea now where the examination systems are good. Uh, should we continue them? What about the legal exam? Now we have law schools. Um, what about making students take exams in English? These are, these are important issues. So the, the number one problem that already was seen in China and seen in Korea was this. The examination system was supposed to produce good men who were competent. That is, the theory was you could read the answer to these essay questions. You could see the moral logic they used when um, discussing um, these classical issues, and you could see who was a good person and who wasn't. A bad person's character should show forth, a good person's character should illuminate. But no, it didn't happen because uh, Clearly, uh, in retrospect, many bad people were passing. Many uh, so-called evil people, not the known to have bad people were passing, it seemed. Um, and there arose a deep concern about whether the examination, in fact, was being gained. The examination was somehow 
producing uh, uh, even the reverse, a kind of counter-effective And so this led, in 1519, to a tremendous crisis, a famous moment in Korean history, when a great reformer, Zhou Guangzhou, said, stop, the examination system is wrong. We have to do something different. And he said, the problem is this. The examination system is facilitating bad men passing. We have to change the system to recommendation. The idea was simple. If you recommend good people to take the test, only good people will pass. Uh, and it was tried once, and it was a failure. It has a simple, powerful flaw you can imagine, which is, who is going to recommend all your friends and relatives? And so it became a cozy in-group. The examination was um, the, uh, abolished, and the people who passed were in prison, some of them, and spent many years trying to restore their fame. Another kind of problem uh, was cheating. Now, it's not as uh, huge a problem as you'd think. Um, because uh, the, in traditional Korean, in, in the Chosun dynasty, you couldn't cheat without someone knowing it. And sooner or later, that fact would become known. And it was relentless. It was relentless. There was a very famous case in 13, uh, 1535, I think, Shim Tong Wen, Shim Yun, two brothers passed. And the theory was they had written their answer to, to curry favor with the examiner, a famous guy named uh, Kim Alo. And so they had, they had cheated by moral, they had morally cheated. They had written the answer to, to curry favor with the examiner. And, and later, so uh, 22 years later, uh, the one brother was dead, but the second, Shim Tong was still alive. They took away his degree uh, 22 years later because it was decided he had cheated. And uh, these kind of uh, cases did come up. Um, and so if, if you cheated, and you could cheat in information, you could have like a, a, a little cram um, book you could stick into your pocket. Or, worst case, you could have someone take the exam for you. You could have someone take the exam for you. And that was really dangerous because you, that person could blackmail you. So these were not, these were not very, uh, but they're talked about. There were also cram schools. This is a period when people began trying to, to learn the system, to gain it. But as far as we know, those didn't work too well. A greater danger, in fact, occurred in the 19th century. Uh, those of you who know Korean history know this. The 19th century is a period of complex change. A modern Korea is sort of being created in the face of uh, threats from abroad. And great, powerful families, the Pungyang Zhou, the Andong Kim, the Yehong Min, the Namyang Hongs, these families had such strength, they were able suspiciously to pass many of their members. If you look at the, the ranks of who passed in the 19th century, they look very similar to this list of great families. And so the exam itself, in short, was probably being corrupted. It wasn't impossible for an outsider to pass. It was harder and harder. And so in 1890, 1894, when reformers came in with the Japanese uh, at the time during the Donghak situation, the, the Sino-Japanese War, when the reformers came in, the Kabul reformers, one thing they did was they did away with the examination system. Amazing, amazing. But it shows you how unpopular the examination system was and how it had become discredited. In contemporary Korea, the examination system has been uh, reborn in different forms. We can talk about that. Uh, the examin state examination systems are just as important now. Uh, so, uh, two more questions, one I put here, one I didn't, was the problem is this. Simply, most people would never pass. And that was taken for granted. It was a huge social problem, I think. Because in every man's life, aside from one in, one in uh, maybe one in, one in a thousand, two in a thousand, um, who passed, 99% of men, there came a moment in their life when they said in their hearts, uh, I give up. I can't do it anymore. As we'll see in a minute, the median age of passing was 34. The median. That means half the people who passed were older than 34. So many men who passed eventually tried from the time they were 15 to the time they were 50 before they finally passed. But many people tried into their 60s and eventually just gave up. Uh, and so the, there's a famous case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Nam Yang Joshi, a famous philosopher. He just couldn't pass somehow. And his wife kept berating him. 
his mother kept berating him and making him feel so, uh, so foolish and sad. It was a horrible blow to the... And so being a yangban was no fun at all. To be a yangban, I'll take a moment, to be a yangban was to be a loser. Yangban were all losers, aside from the tiny number that passed. The average commune, the average lineage, median number of passers in the whole dynasty, only two people. Two people. The average lineage. So you could wait hundreds of years before someone from your family would pass. So this is a, this is a social problem. Um, but ironically, it's probably part of the success of the dynasty by delaying, deferring, uh, and humiliating a large group of threats to the state the king could somehow maintain his power. Another, another issue I should have put up, which I didn't, which is an important one, which is, is really the way to be a moral man to spend all your time studying for the exam? This was never solved. Jushi thought about this. Many moral men said, I'm not going to do this. This is a waste of time. It's a waste of my imagination, my effort. It's far better for me to do philosophy, poetry. It's better for me to think and talk and act in a moral way. I don't need to waste my life in the exam. And so that tension also um, uh, was maintained. <clears throat> now, moving on to the second part of my talk. Let's see how my talk is going here. Okay. I'm going on too long. I will be fast. It's simply the question is this. When you pass the exam, what did it matter? We didn't know the answer to that question. Now we know we have some data. Thanks to the efforts of Edward Wagner and Song Jun Ho, for about 30 years they assembled this um, uh, database. Within this database, which is all 14,607, I looked at a core group of 4,000 passers over 174 years this period to analyze who got ahead. And I used a very simple and powerful, I think, idea, which is who became a Don San Juan, who became a minister, ministerial rank within um, this group of passers. So even though you passed, only a few became ministers. I looked at that. In the same passer, but you have a huge chance to become a minister. That is, uh, even in the distant past, soul people were preferred in many ways. This, this shows in a different cut you can read in your text. The percent of all the Dhamsan people, all the, the ministers, were um, like 74% of soul. The rest are very uh, small. And it goes all the way down to, to say, Hamgyongdo. Um, <clears throat> over. It didn't change too much. Seoul continued to have a very high, um, a very high chance, reduced perhaps because of the, the Japanese invasions. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, this seemed to be the limit. There was, a, there was a kind of balance achieved beyond which Seoul could not gain even greater faith. <coughs> But throughout the dynasty, Seoul enjoyed a special privilege. I looked at a different category of the um, first test. Remember I said if you studied uh, poetry, was it better? Or if you studied classics, it's better. The, the answer is clear. It's better, to study, um, it's better to study poetry. Poetry gave you an edge in, um, you see from Seoul on the left, the 56.7. These are the group that study poetry, the 50.3. These are the guys that study um, classics. The same is true for, for uh, the, the red ones. These are non soul passers. The same are true, the, 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 true for overall. <clears throat> I looked at the median age of passing, and this shows that people from soul pass earlier. They had, a uh, they had an advantage. And uh, the um, uh, ones who took, interestingly, the ones in soul who passed the jinsa, the, the, the uh, poetry, passed younger than the classics, but in the provinces it was the opposite. This is simple, I think it's because there were better teachers, there were better poetry teachers in Seoul. And finally, the, uh, I'm talking here about the uh, 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 percent of uh, the Zhangling Kupche attaining Damsan. So if you pass number one in the nation, this is an amazing, Koreans do not believe this when they say this. If you pass number one in the nation, and you were from the provinces, you had only a one quarter chance of becoming a minister. If you pass number one, you're from Seoul, you had a 75% chance. So even passing number one in the nation, you had almost, you had less chance uh, to pass um, than half. It's an amazing fact. Uh, I looked at lineages just quickly. 
There's not much advantage to being from a big lineage versus a small lineage. There's a little advantage. Um, and finally, uh, this is an amazing thing. I looked at the number of the bottom 300. These are the lowest score. These are the dummies. These are the people who got the lowest score. So the sole, the stupid group, so to speak, among the geniuses, 44% became ministers. But only 13% of non-soul, and overall 22%. So remember, 44%. That means it's better to be the stupidest person from Seoul than to be the number one pastor from the provinces. <laughs> These are uh, unbelievable figures. So summing up, um, I've gone fast. I hope you can review the date the these are. The uh, importance of the state examination system um, is extraordinary. This was a small rural society, a few million people at the of the world with little or no connection to the outside world. But within their little cloistered world, so to speak, next to the largest country in the world, China, next to Japan, which had the largest city in the world, Edo, the Koreans kept the faith, literally. They put themselves through this incredible torture of spending decades trying to learn and master esoteric ways of becoming better human beings, um, to the extent that torturing themselves in a way. Um, Along the way, it meant that every male member of the aristocracy was literate. It's an extraordinary achievement. But I see this as a, a potent means of social control, ideologically, of course. But it, it meant you, you, you spent your passionate youth studying these old classics. It said 99% of the population came to believe in their hearts that they were failures. Just studied a little harder. If I were just a little smarter, I could succeed. I'm a failure. And so this had to have a cumulative effect. Uh, and finally, uh, examination culture is far from dead. It's been revived and reconfigured after 1945. It's a crucial aspect in Korea's rise to its current state of economic uh, glory. Thank you very much.